Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. I am Paul Sisler, and this is In The Moment. Hello, hello, hello. I know that a few of you noticed there's a little add-on to the intro there. Um, suicides are on the rise. And one of the things that t and I are going to talk about today is mental health. And I, I want people to know that t and I, we are not doctors. We are not psychologists. We don't have a degree in this. Um, the things that we're talking about come from personal experience. So if you are in a mental health crisis, um, please call uh, 988 and, you know, talk to a professional. Talk to somebody that can help you. And with that said, welcome to the Vellum. And here is T-Paw. Hello, T-Paw. Hey. <laughs> this is t <Tipa. laughs> I was gonna. I almost pointed it your way, and this is, uh, or this is Paul, and because <laughs> like I almost pulled the whole crazy piece thing yesterday. Like it's like cause what I do is I always point at myself and go, "I'm t -Paw. and then I point at Carnage. He goes, "That I'm Carnage." And this is crazy piece. Anyway, wrong podcast. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I I wanted to talk about um, writing and healing. I called it growing pains. Because it's something that just grows and it's mandatory and it's supposed to be there. It reminds us that we're human. And, uh, you know, because what happens with mental health is when depression gets you or anxiety gets you, you know, the, the furling funnel of, of fear that grows like a web in your mind it spirals out and it touches every little tendril of nerve ending you got. And often it does it when you're not even looking. Often it does it like, you know, you think everything's great. You're doing great at coping. You're doing your best at uh, doing what you do best, which is getting so busy you can't even think about it at all until late at night when you cr come crashing down. And suddenly out of nowhere, it's creeping its way back in your mind and reminding you it exists. And so I, it's one of the things I want to talk about, which is healing from writing. And it's often something we all crave as an outlet. Um, when it comes to uh, the craft, of writing it's all very gentle right like we all have different things we play with and that's fine uh, i i yeah. didn't i i personally started writing when i was 14. Like a lot of people have these like cute little stories about when they were little kids and stuff um i was a writer back then i did i just didn't like use a pen to do it i was i was a kid so i told stories with my mouth it was very oral and so when it came to learning the craft it wasn't until after I realized, and I don't think back then I realized it back then, I just knew it was, I was in pain. Um, back then it was the COVID trauma. And it wasn't until the therapist at uh, the, the military base, my dad, I practically begged him for therapy. So he's like, okay, well, I can't afford that. So what he found that he could do was take us on base. There was a on-call family therapist that they had that was covered. And so, you know, the compromise was that I couldn't get a personal therapist, but that I could get a family therapist. So they went ahead and, and dad would have us meet with her. And there'd be times where I would have one-on-one -on -one sessions with her because I, I knew I was, I knew I was in a bad place. I knew I was, even as a teenager, I had that level of self-awareness. Some of the teenagers, they don't do that. They, they just want to escape it. They do drugs. They have, they find some other outlet that's not so healthy that they want to do, but not that I might, like, you know, give myself a pat on the back for that or for anything. I just know I didn't want to do those things, and I just knew I was self-aware enough to know I was fucked up. I just didn't know, didn't use the phrase "fucked up." But like at fourteen, fifteen, um, you know, I decided that I needed to write in a more visceral way because back then I was kind of a, I, I, you know, how, like sometimes I'll pop off with you know, swear words are all, are all be me. At 14, I was still the kid who was trying to be good, trying to be like, you know, oh, I'm this goody good person. I don't break rules. And yet I knew I was a rebel. But basically, misery is a state of mind. It's where you live a lot of times, especially when you're trying to escape it. And that's where anger, you know how like a lot of times people have anger issues or they'll walk through the day. And then they'll write that with their character. The, the writing it with your character is actually one of the most healthy things you can do. Because then it's taking it out of you and it's putting it in this fictional person. And then that, you know, those fictional people are the ones that have to deal with it. But if you're, yours is so strong that it can't just be done with that, 
therapist is probably a better option. But basically, but you could also do both. You could do the therapist. In fact, you, what I did as a kid, which I didn't realize it was actually a very good strategy because I just figured I would do it. Um, I wasn't thinking about strategy back then. I was just thinking about coping. But what I did was I take the things I wrote and then I would go to the therapist. And now this comes down to also trust because it's a very tender relationship between you and this therapist person, someone that's basically they're a coach. They're helping you deal with stuff and you're revealing stuff to them that you probably wouldn't reveal to anybody else. But basically you would go to them and then I would read it out to her and then we'd both try to interpret what I wrote, which was, you know, one of the steps, but it's, it's also a choice to be enveloped by these painful things, which we're all prone to doing. You were telling me about stuff you deal with and I tell you stuff that I deal with. And I feel like, I feel like by you choosing to be here and you talking to me on this podcast, that is something that you're doing to help cope with it. And it's awesome. Oh, yes. Yes. I give you props for that. Um, writing itself in the creative sense also allows one to channel emotions and experiences, thoughts on a page, and it's a visceral experience. The reason why I wrote that line is because I just, I feel like with writing, uh, one thing we're all kind of, because like there's so many people out there that are trying to chase the dragon and trying to get famous, and that's awesome, but it's also something that falls into this ballpark. It's the whole, you know, there's like there's got there's there's something there that hasn't been scratched yet, and that way when you get to that point, you're writing for you, like you're you're writing for everybody else too, but your writing's it's more from an internal place rather than an external place. For years, I was external. For years, it was I'd write something and then I'd be like, oh, do you guys like it? And you know that that's dangerous because then you're like, oh, I'm not writing for me anymore. I'm writing for a giant vacuum. In which the giant vacuum might give me a high five, or it might just walk away. <laughs> so you yeah. have to like change that perspective. So, what are some of your thoughts on the beginning here, Paul? Well, it, it's How you doing here? so some of your best writers, your best musicians, your your best artists, and so many different fields. Um, their 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 creativity comes from their own darkness. You know, their, their, their own pain, their own suffering, their own trauma, their own life experiences. And um, writing has helped me tremendously, tremendously. I, I would not be here probably if not for writing. Um, as you and I were discussing in the green room before we got started and all that, um, I, I was in an accident and I, I live in immense pain every day. And every day that I wake up, I wake up with suicidal thoughts. Now, it's not something that I talk about a lot, but I'm aware that these thoughts are coming into my head, and that's not the direction that I want to go. Now, one might ask, you know, so, Paul, are you suicidal? The thoughts are there, so, yes, I am. But I'm also aware that I don't want to go away now, you know? Now, there was a time where I did want to go away, you know, but... Now I envelop myself into so many other things like the podcast that I do. Um, you'll see me on Twitter spaces. You'll see me engaging in conversation. Um, yeah. And my writing, um, I, I, I get dark thoughts. Um, I put it down on paper because that helps me. It helps me get rid of my demons, you might say. Those yeah. Things demons in the back of the head that keep saying it's not worth it anymore. The, the, the pain that you're going through, it's not worth it anymore. Just go away and you'll be done. You won't be in pain anymore. And I tell myself it is worth it because the things that I'm doing are productive. They're good. They, they, they can give other people hope. So that's why I continue to go on, you know, but there's people out there that, you know, um, the reason why I put the, whole suicide uh, crisis line up at the beginning and all that is that suicide is on the rise. You know, there's people that are losing hope. They're losing that um, drive and ambition to keep going and they're going away. And yeah. there's, nothing, there's nothing that I can say or you can say or anything like that. That's going to change what they do with themselves. 
But if we can inspire a little hope, maybe they can change what they think about life and decide to stay. Because that's what I've done. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's what I speaks to what I was talking about here with the whole you made a choice to be here. You made a choice to, to stay around and to do this podcast. And it, it may seem like such the one of the most throwaway things in the world. And you know, someone could probably, you know, listen to that or watch that and be like and, and just be like, oh, no, that's just happenstance. No, that's just, you know, Paul talking. No, it's not. Like, how do you know that? How do you, how do you measure that? And so I, I personally, I, I'm beyond grateful that you're even here, especially with what you were telling me. Like, that's pretty intense, especially with somebody that is just got done signing a, a, or I think you signed a contract with the publisher and you're looking at trying to get that baby into the world. Yes. Not, yeah, <laughs> so, on it, but yes. It's still a pretty big thing. Like that is, you know, that's a dream move. And that's like, you know, any you know, there's like millions of people that are dying for that that position to happen to them. And so uh and the fact that you get to walk your dog and you get all that stuff, and yet you're still dealing with that chasm in your mind that's causing this current that shows up where it's invasive, it's penetrative, it, it doesn't you know, it's not a good thing. It's poisonous. And you're fighting it by being here. You're fighting it by walking the dog. You're fighting it by doing all those things that make us human, you know, that, that create a semblance of awesomeness. Like, that was, for me, like, years uh, when Ares was still around. And it's funny because this phone has popped up on his box. He's Ash's box. But for years and years, just walking him was a big deal. Just being able to walk, take him for a walk and being able to do that because for a dog that is a bonding experience like for a dog like for us humans like going to the theater going to a concert playing a game you know whatever those things are those, those are our bonding things but with a dog the, the walk is their bonding experience and to them we're giant giants and we live a lot longer and so that's a big deal you know and, and it's like um i like i like to latch on to those things because that's what that's one of the most important things, especially after I lost Aries, it became magnified. Like suddenly I was walking around the block without having a dog next to me. And it was because my mind, my mind and my body was so used to it over the years that it felt off not doing it. And right. so I, I, and I, and it was my way of coping with his absence. Like he was gone. And so how did, you know, fractured t function during that first, like, <laughs> year or two after Aries passed away back in like 2017 um i walked around the block without a dog next to me and it may have looked weird or maybe you just thought i was just taking a night stroll it doesn't really matter and but it was my way of you know dealing with it it's my way of dealing with the absence like because for a couple weeks i wasn't doing that and i kept bringing up i'm like oh i he's so used to walking Aries right now it's weird it's about this time is usually when he sneezes at my feet and like just his little thing where he jumps up, he goes, Whoa. and like, you know, because he does his thing. And he's not doing that right now. He can't. And uh, my brother was like, why don't you just walk, you know, around the block like you got the dog next to you? And then after a while, you know, he finally like, clicked, he brings those together. And was like, why don't you walk my dog? But like, basically, uh, you know, uh, that was happening. And it was, it was an absence. And um, for instance, in my writing, um, various times I will sit there because I don't like to. The way I see it with the story, as you know, is I like I see it as a sequence of events. I don't like to repeat sequences. So if I put in more than one scene where a character, like for instance, is riding a giant dog in the sky, um, I like to alter it up a little bit. But whenever I do write scenes where Peter and Ares are are out, you know, flying in the air or they're doing stuff together, like whether they're running along or something, that's really me being like, hey, by the way, I used to walk my dog. So this is me putting a version of that in the story. Um, but it's like, it's, it's a way of coping. And so the reason why I wanted to bring up the whole, that's all thing is that it's hard to pinpoint exactly for me when I started, but because of the fact that somewhere between 14 and 15, that stuff's like really blacked out. Like there were various giant blocks of my life and teenhood that I'm just like, hello memory. I see a still picture, but where the hell is the video? <laughs> and so like some people are like, it's so visceral for me. I can smell the things that are around me. And I'm like, I, I'm lucky if I get past one image. 
and they're like, wait, what? And I'm like, the video doesn't play. <laughs> but uh, basically, um, blacked out memories or images that I have in my mind, the faded or just single images. There was a story I wrote years and years ago. I was like 14, 15. I think I was trying to write Dracula. I'm not entirely sure, but I watched a lot of vampire movies, vampire shows, and it was like, hey, this is a really cheesy vampire show. Maybe I can write my own. And of course, I went a little darker with it myself, but basically, it was a vampire guy. It was supposed to be a war going on. Also, some love story that like describes half of the population of vampire stories. But it crafted love and affection and saw a lot of bad fantasy movies and shows with vampires in them. Uh, basically, the idea here is that I knew it was shit going in, but I wrote it anyway. And it was a way of me being able to cope with something that was going on back then. And I was like, I was I think it was a freshman or sophomore in high school. But basically, the gist that I'm getting to here is with that story is that inside of the most silliest, basic stuff, you could be putting a trauma in or you could be, you know, finding a coping mechanism. It doesn't even have to be trauma. You could just be like, it's about your body's going, I'm blanking out right now. I don't know how to process this. So I'm going to go escape. And so that, and that's fine. Like acknowledging that you're, you know, what your body's doing, acknowledging what your mind is doing is part of the battle because you may think, Oh, I'm just doing avoidance, which is what my youngest sibling always tells me. Nico is like, I'm avo I'm doing avoiding. And I'm like, what do you mean avoiding? I'm doing avoidance. So I'm like, oh, I get it now. Like at first I was like, what are you avoiding? And then you know, and then I was like, wait a minute, you're doing avoidance. You're 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 doing what I do. I'm just doing it in a different way. Because me, I get so busy and preoccupied. I'm like, oh, depression, anxiety. I didn't know you were there. Hi, bye. And then I run away. And and I go do things. And then I end up burying myself. But at least I'm not thinking about it. But I'm able to cope. And even me talking about, you know, this stuff. That's what Paul meant at the very beginning here when he said, we're just two guys who can speak to it from experience because they got wow. beat up in the process. Um, you know, not talking like gargoyles here being like, let me tell you how to live your life. No, I'm yeah. just the guy who's yeah. like, make it stop. And then realized I could get busy and then process it differently. But yeah. one of the things that I want to get to is positive reawakening or positivity or cognitive, you know, cognitive realignment. It's, it's a process that I had to learn a lot over the years, especially dealing with the wife's mental health and dealing with life altering situations that like happen. It was like this. It was like her life, mental health, her mental health. Field. And then mine, mine along the way would do this and shudder like an engine that needed oil or something and <laughs> and then like it would be like a parallel experience because my and all that was happening Aries was passing away then my mom's passing away and a bunch of other stuff seemed small and micro and yet it ended up ballooning in my head and became too much to bear and so i had to learn how to realign the thoughts realign the chi um you've talked in the past to yourself about how you're you've got like a bit of the um my brain is not thinking of the word for it. <laughs> but basically, you're a spiritual atheist, and which is an interesting concept. But um, basically, realignment in the moment, cognitive reawareness. And so when you yourself are waking up in the, day, in the morning and you're having those thoughts, those really dark ones that probably you want it to stay hidden, and yet it won't because it keeps going, hey, I'm here. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, you are realigning yourself by deciding to do a podcast, by deciding to <laughs> do things that aren't that, that aren't that negative dark action against yourself. And I appreciate you for it. Now, I don't know if you know you're doing that, but cognitive reawakening is basically a way of being like, yes, I'm in this position. Yes, I have these thoughts. Yes, I'm here. But what can I do that's different from it? And the positives that are in my life right now are this, this, and this, like, you know, X, Y, Z. And basically listing off the things like, you know, seeing, saying, yes, this is pretty bad, but it could be this. And right now it's not. And also uh, flipping it entirely and being like, well, in this situation, I may have these thoughts, but I also have this. 
And that way it's basically reminding yourself. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like somebody's literally like on call, just like on your shoulder that pops up and like a button and goes, Hey, I know you're having those bad thoughts, but you could, you know, you, you have this too. And then they put up like the list of positivity and then suddenly you're anchored again, you're grounded. And you know, you're able to keep yourself going. What are some of your thoughts on that one, Paul? Well, uh, let, let, let me give you a little backstory. Before my accident, I was working in a casino. I was a bounty hunter, and I was going to school all at the same time. In other words, I was motivated and driven. I was working out every day. I was in the, the, the peak performance of my life, you know. And then the accident, and I went from doing all of that to doing nothing. That messes with you mentally right there. And then you're living mm -hmm. in that pain, and you're living through all of that. So that was a battle. And then um, it ended up that we moved, and where we moved – I got to go outside, do some work, some exercise. So it started bringing me back. I, I was trying to rebuild myself, you know. Um, had, got a beautiful pup pup that had a whole half an acre to run on that I got to fix for her. And, you know, it meant something. And my wife helped me. And then I also had another pup pup and a bunny rabbit. Uh, the bunny rabbit died. That was devastating for me. Um, one of the pup pups died. That was devastating. Um, and then, you know, up here you can, my, my wife, she passed away. And I started going right back into that darkness that I worked so hard to get out of. And um, before I, you know, Everything my wife went through financially, it was uh, um, breaking us. And um, I just, when, when she passed, I, I was like months away from becoming homeless. I had to sell my house. Um, now I, I moved down here. My pup pup doesn't have the half acre to run in because it's not fenced in. So um, I, I haven't been able to do that, but I take her out on walks. So now I have a reassessment of responsibilities. And that brings me back to, I have challenges that I'm facing. And because I love my pup pup so much, I get up every single morning and I take her on a walk. I live in a desert now, so I have to get her out before it gets hot. I have to take her out at night, uh, right before the uh, sun goes down when it's cool enough. We got coyotes out here, so lots of coyotes. So I can't take her for a midnight walk. I mean, you know, too much risk. So I have responsibilities, and those responsibilities, um, they, they, they give you a reason to keep going. So when, you, so when you start doing other things like writing, I put a lot of my frustration into my writing, my anger, my, you know, the things that just really – piss me off that goes into my writing and, and with that i produce some good things and then you mentioned like sitting here um doing these shows that i do it gives me something to do it brings in positivity even when i'm talking about negative subjects it gives me a sense of belonging it gives me a sense of i'm doing some good because i can discuss these bad things with other people that also have a like mind view on it, or even if it's opposing, we can have a discussion and go back and forth on things. It gives me purpose. And I find that a lot of people that when they start going down that spiral, they start losing purpose. And when you lose purpose, you lose yourself. So I think that writing and any other art form of creativity, even going out and punch, doing a punching bag, whatever it is, you start giving yourself purpose again. And purpose, I think, is really, really important in this conversation that we're having. People start losing themselves and they don't believe they have a purpose anymore. And when you don't have a purpose, why be here? So yeah. 
if you can redevelop a purpose and give yourself that purpose, now you have a reason to move forward. And those dark thoughts start to lessen and lessen and lessen and better thoughts start coming into your head. So yeah, it, 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 it's an ongoing battle. And, you know, uh, and again, you and I have talked about a lot of these things and it comes back to that where you're leading right now, positivity. Um, and I yep. think positivity leads into giving yourself purpose. So there you go. It does, especially since depression, it, it eats purpose, right? Like it, depression is literally the antithesis to existence and purpose. And it, it's like this venomous cloud that exists in your head, above your head, wherever it is around you. It, it, it basically, it's the, it's the parasite that is not in symbiosis with you because it just eats you, right? Like it, it consumes you. And that's why in like a lot of fantasy shows, when they do go into that, it's, you know, it's this fun little cloud of smoke or something that like, goes, ah, and then like it eats you and stuff. And like, they often give it a nickname or they call it something different. But really, the bat, the bare thick of it, it is something that eats, it eats Paul, for instance, or it eats me. Like you know, it's it's a thing that you know feeds. Recognizing you need an outlet or help is such an admirable thing. Appreciate that, Gustav. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I, that's the thing is, is, I think there are so many adults that were wowed commenting on what she's talking about there's so many adults that were wild when i was a teenager that were like oh my god you're you're you know see me have an issue and you're, you know and they were like practically like turning like they were going hail hail and i'm just like oh and i'm all like i'm just a dumb teenager who doesn't know what he's doing but like I, I i'm at least recognizing that i need something and so um i, I was like thanks i think and so but um yeah, I don't know. It, it's awesome. Yeah, she's right. It is awesome to be able to recognize that because, like you or Shadow Fox or anybody else out there who is one of those fellow people who you know recognize that you need to have help in something, and you see so you search it out for most people, and like it is something that is awesome to have because there's a lot of people out there who don't have that, and then when you show them it or you show them that they you know that they should get help or they should have help of some kind they get ruthlessly aggressive about it or they get like really antagonistic and they fight it. And you're well, just like going, Bruh. because they've been taught that asking for help is a weakness. And let me tell you, asking for help is not a weakness. It is not a weakness. And if you're in that mindset that if you have issues going on and if your fear is, is that you're going to appear weak because you're asking for help, trust me when I tell you, it is, it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. And this is where the spirituality that Shadow Fox talks about on the flow comes into play and the stoicism that Benny and I discuss on our Becoming Stoic on Mondays and that Bryce and Benny talk about in both of their stoic spaces, Okay. This conception of being weak because you have to ask for help is just BS. Just know it. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm not right up here and I need somebody to help me. I, I need to get my head straight. I need to figure out what's going wrong. That takes courage. That yep, takes it does. Courage. All right. And that's one of the four cardinal virtues of stoicism, courage. And with that, you gain the wisdom that you need to fix what's going on up here so that you can go forward. So where we talk about writing, I also want to bring in reading. Mm -hmm. Reading is a good source of, of putting your mind elsewhere. And I highly recommend Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Okay. I love those plugs you're doing. It's so great. <laughs> well, that goes with the stoicism, you know. Uh, Siddhartha. Okay. That goes more into like uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, you know. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to bring you into a different line of thinking. 
you know, and with that, you might find something that you resonate with that will give you strength. Uh, we were just in a space and there was a young man. And again, I, 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 he's not here to talk about it himself, so I'm not going to use his name. Um, he had grown up. Life was rough. He made a lot of bad decisions. He went to jail um, and he had done lots of bad things. And his family were telling him that he needs to do this and he needs to do that. And, of course, he wasn't listening to his family and stuff. And while he was in jail, he started reading books on stoicism. And with that, he recognized things that he was doing wrong within himself. And this gave him hope to do better. It gave him purpose to be a better person. It gave him positivity. So reading, you may not be a writer. You may not have what you believe to be any artistic skills at all, any creative art skills at all. So what do I do? Well, pick up a book. Pick yep. Up a book. Go to a different world, you know, because the world right now that you're living in, um, no matter what it is you got going on and whether it's uh, PTSD, whether it's some kind of trauma related thing, whether it's just life simply sucks, the world is hurting me. Um, Find an escape that you can relate to that brings you back and gives you hope. Also, listening to books. I was going to point that out. Like, if you are just, like, if you're someone out there who's like, but I don't like reading, or reading takes too much time. No, it doesn't. Not really. It's the same amount of time as reading, listening to an audiobook. But you know what will probably make you feel more comfortable and less intimidated? Listening to an audiobook. Because then you can put it your earbud in your ear, or however you listen to them. And you can, like, you know, turn on an audiobook, and then suddenly you're still transported to a different world. It may be a voice you're not, you know, used to hearing in your head, but it's still a voice. And you can still listen to the story, and it'd be just as effective, if not more effective, than reading. Like, lately, for me, I've been finding it hard to find time to read everybody's stuff, right? And with the kids and with everything else going on, it, it's just it's something that I'm like, if I read more than five pages without getting hyperly distracted by Cass, who's like, Daddy, Daddy, I need something from you. It is really dig like it's an achievement. Like I, I was just joking around with the wife one day, I was like going, you know, there should be an achievement for people who are like me. And she's like, What do you mean? I'm like, people who are dads who like have to like answer a billion different things in one day and then wonder where the hell did the day go? And then they go and they look at their thing and they go, oh my God, I was able to open a video game. Or, oh my God, I was able to read five pages of a story. Special award for me because, you know, I'm so preoccupied with being the thing that, you know, people like either assume that ne never happens or, uh, or, or they assume the worst things about it and I'm being a dad. But like uh, listening to audiobooks, they are extremely important. Like, do you know how powerful the oral written word is? You know why I say that? Because when you talk to people at the store or when you talk to your friends or when you talk to people in general, like on Twitter or in, you know, in spaces, or if you talk to them or if you just simply are listening to something like on news or you're watching a movie or something, you know what you're doing in the process? You're listening. You're using your ear. You're using your ears. And when you're watching a movie, you're definitely using your ears because one of the most important things in a movie, in, aside from the fact the picture moves, is sound sound design like there was a lot of work that went into making sure that everything was level that you could hear those characters in the movie but then also there was a lot of work that was done with the score the scoring that movie and like making sure that when they were on set they were able to you know either do the volume balance so well that you don't even notice there's volume which is really just the sound stage and not being on set or not being on on location and there's a lot of factors that go into movie making but one of the most important ones is sound. And when you're listening to an audiobook, you're listening to somebody who is able to uh, be in a booth or create a booth, like I did here, and uh, use that to create a sound space where you can listen to the story come to life. And it's either they're a voice acting or they are just simply reading. And you know, whichever style is, is still valid, and it's it, you know, whichever style is still works across the board. Um, I was gonna. I mean, use that to 
transition into transmuting, uh, you know, the writing and reading to be a transmuting tool to help us be self-aware, manage emotions, and manifest a better forward-thinking mentality. You know, one of the things I've been using this last year, uh, especially after you started introducing on your podcast stuff, uh, you know, uh, stoicism. Uh, the ability to control your emotions while still being one of the most empathetic people in the room. And you'll often come off either closed off, rude or whatever. Um, and you'll, you know, there's been, like, I, I saw lots of side effects socially. Um, but at the end of the day, you're also able to control and manage and compartmentalize those same emotions that are normally so extreme, they're hard to process. And, you know, it's a way of being able to spin it in a positive direction. Um, now, remember, I'm not telling anyone to ignore your issues or do avoidance. Quite the opposite. Face them in whatever way helps you do that. Um, even in getting up in the morning is facing an issue, right? Because for those people who can barely even get up at all, you just got up. You just right. did what you have been laying in bed avoiding doing. Uh, don't avoid it. Simply saying writing or reading, as you pointed out, um, can be utilized to help channel a mindset change and realignment. Uh, can't learn uh, to cope with pain and learn to build those muscles of emotional stability if we do not learn techniques and skills to help orient and arm us. Um, every day, I will look at my wife and ask her who's steering the wheel because of her condition. And the condition affects all of our parts of our life, whether it's the kid life, whether it's our author life, whether it's the job life. Like, it doesn't matter what, you know, part of the life it is. Her condition affects it. And so I always end up, you know, touching base with her. And what I just talked about with avoidance, that is something she does. That is one of the tools that she uses that are negative <laughs> that causes us to have side effects. And I have to, like, whether it's in my control or not, I have to try and help in some way and help her steer her back on a decent grounded path so that we're not in a danger zone because in the last several years, in fact, since, you know, the kids have been getting older and they're growing and now my three-year-old is no longer a three-year-old is now an eight-year-old and, you know, my two-year-old is no longer two, he's now seven. And then you got Phoenix and you got now Luciana, like they're going to grow older. And with that being said, I've been seeing some of the same stuff that typically happens with a group of four children um, and mental health. I've been seeing some of it start to manifest. And so I had to like, be like, all right, let's, let's go back to being stoic. Let's go back to being, you know, these things that way we can help steer it. Um, so Speaking to what you're talking, been talking about in your podcast, your other podcast with like, you know, cognitive awareness and with stoicism and managing emotions. Those are tools that have helped T Paul over here. Just so you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm going to throw you a little uh, tip here and all that in relation to avoidance, because um, I'm someone that um, I'll step into avoidance. Okay. Um, if I get angry, upset, or mad, instead of saying something that I might regret later or not being able to organize my thoughts in a way that will make sense, I will step away and not talk about it. And I don't like to be pride about it because that just aggravates me even more and makes it harder. So... I usually take a day or two. Sometimes it could even be a week before I will, you know, and th th this is when back when my wife was, you know, still alive and I would just uh, come out and I would sit down and I'd say, okay, remember last week when X, Y, and Z happened, I was having troubles processing that. And here's why I acted this way, that way. Here's my apologies. What can we do to go beyond this? And the beautiful thing about it is, is that my wife knew this about me. And yeah, it got to where when I was like that, she would give me that room because she knew I would come forward and talk. So um, 
sometimes I would have to call somebody else and talk to them. So those stells, if T Paul's getting on your nerves, you can call me. <laughs> T Paul, so that you can go back and put it in alignment and fix things. But you know, th that's just it. You know, um, sometimes people can't organize their thoughts. They, they, they can't put them in an order to say what they're feeling. Because you got to remember, sometimes emotions, there are no words for certain things that you feel. You, there's just not a word for it. How do I describe, you know, when, 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 you know how you get that tingly feeling in your arms and your upper body, um, your chest suddenly feels tight and you, you, you want to cry and yet you want to scream and your fingers start to tingle on the ends. What, what, what the hell do you call that? How do you describe that? How do you tell somebody where that's coming from and why it's coming in that form? Because I don't know what it means. How are you going to know what it means? And what can what word can I put to it? There is no word. There, there, there isn't anything to put to it. Because that's what I feel at that moment. And I don't know what it is. It's got me confused. And I have to sort through it so that I can figure it out. And sometimes I need a little time to do that. So one of the things that I've learned to do is that when I get to that, I get out my iPad and I start writing poetry because it helps me work through it. Because now I'm trying to write a poem that describes what it is I'm feeling. So again, here we are back to the writing and the healing aspect. I wish I would have been doing this decades ago you know but i same yeah I, I i didn't know that that would be something that would help i mean no one ever told me that writing could help me work through stuff you know and now oh my god um i i do a lot of writing uh, if i were to show you my uh go to pages and show you all the works that i have on there um <laughs> don't title something that says blank one blank two i have like 800 blanks okay because wow there's no title to it um it, it, it's just this is what i was feeling and this is what i put down you know and i was at that point where i needed that outlet and that's what i did so it's there and every once in a while i go back and i start reading through them and it's just like oh yeah and it becomes a poem. Yeah, a beautiful poem of awesomeness. One, because poem uh, Paul wrote it, wrote it, but also because Paul's good at what he does and knows how to smith words. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you, T. Paul. Very welcome. You know, I love your poetry and I love how you're able to transmit that pain and transmit all that stuff that's going on in your head back onto the page so that it, you know, not only is cohesive, it, it's basically like, it's basically one of those, those cute, like elegant band-aids that you can have because like, you know, cause Paul's elegant about it. Um, I've listened to your poetry a lot. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, uh, I, I feel like, um, it's one of the most elegant forms of dancing to me, dealing with trauma, dealing with pain. And no matter whether or not you trip over yourself a couple of times or you step on some toes, like it's still a dance. Like that's one of the reasons why I think I uh, renamed a project I'm working on. Uh, it's the sequel to Stunt Snake and the Dame, but it's the double book that is supposed to follow up that story. Um, I was calling it Storms of Blood and Brimstone for a while. And while it was nice to have that title, uh, my uncle Arno pointed out, he's like, that doesn't sound like a romance story. And I'm like, it's not. And he's like, well, what is your story? And I'm like, it's horror romance. It's dealing with gods and monsters and dealing with the dance of love. That's kind of like, it's like a, it's like a weird, like hair metal, death metal song. Because you've got like the, you've got the, the uh, very tantalizing 80s feel to the, you know, to the 
corniness and the, the humor and the, the romance. But then you've also got the 80s of the horror times. Like, you've got them kind of mixed in. It's like a remix playlist. And he's like, well, how about you do a more universal title? And then, like, I was like going, I, what? And so I was, I was like going, I thought this would work really well. And so I was like going, well, let me go ahead and revisit it. Let me revisit it. So I pulled back. I did what I typically do. I was like positive awareness. That the one title is good. Um, it is possible to use it. But there is always a better title. And usually you end up kicking yourself if you don't reconsider it. So I end up revisiting it. And then like I, but I was like, I'll, I'll sleep on it for a couple of days. I was at work one day. And out of nowhere, I was like, wait a minute. Like, I have this tendency to pull a George Martin and associate titles with metaphors or with music or with something of that nature. And since this is a romance horror story or a horror romance, whichever you want to slice it, um, it's like dark fantasy with like a remix playlist inside of it. Let's go ahead and, you know, change a couple of the letters or words. And I ended up coming up with a dance with Blood and Brimstone which is not entirely the same thing, but it is kind of like the same thing. But it's got the words, a uh, dance. So dance is meant to signify synergy. It's meant to signify light. It's meant to introduce the concept of song, of, you know, a, a positive thing. And then you got storms, which uh, alludes to, as I said in the past, it alludes to Trinity's brain traffic. Her, she's dealing with stress. She's dealing with her own storms. And so blood and brimstone obviously has its own significations its own imagery uh blood could be rebirth it could be you know trauma itself it could be a lot of things uh, it could also be just the horror stuff brimstone obviously has associates with fire or with you know a forge or just simply a throne or something like that so a dance of blood and brimstone and i was like look what, what i did there i did some cognitive it was minor but it was like some cognitive Reawareness, some cognitive rethinking, and was like, I may actually like this title a lot more. And so I played with it on the cover, and and I realized I actually did like the title a lot. So hopefully it doesn't change. Uh, hopefully I don't end up running into another one along the line. You know how I am. Like I, I told you this when you were talking about your own stories. Like you, uh, you were like, I don't know which title to use, and I'm like, well, you could go with different approaches and stuff with it and everything. But like for me, I don't settle to the point where like, oh, I'm only gonna call it this thing. Like this is the best working title I have so far. I could call it Exploding Donuts and be the same story. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the title doesn't dictate the story. <laughs> like I could call it, you know, peeing uh, peeing antlers on a highway, or I could call it like run the runaway bucks or you know uh, deers it missing in action, but it doesn't matter. Like the story would still stay the same. So I figure I, I'll, I'll play with it some more and see where it goes. But that was me using a bit of stoicism and a bit of cognitive reawareness to identify that there's an issue, not get wrapped up in it. Cause there's a lot of people out there that will emotionally implode. If they are like, I have to retitle that. I worked hard on that title. It's like, <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I worked on it for five seconds. I was like, ooh, that was called Storm of the Blood, and that was called Prince of Brimstone. Let's just combine the two. And so that's what I did. Um, so now I've retitled it a little bit. But, um, yeah, as far as this goes, like, I basically wanted to cover us talking about the process of cognitive awareness, uh, realignment, using a bit of your stoicism that you talk about a lot, but I've been using myself, and utilizing some of the elements from the other podcasts and you know using writing as a way to or speaking because writing can be speaking there were a lot of tribes and other cultures that for them they they were an orator they would speak and that's how they would tell the story or they would speak and that's how they would explain or learn or teach rather than writing it down um but uh you know whichever way it goes because my uh older brother you know Gostel's uh, brother, uh, in-law, um, he he doesn't write things down. He he speaks it. So anytime that we were do a podcast episode and he's got thoughts he wants to record or he's got things he wants to say, that's where he puts it. And it's you know it's it's the audio. Um, and like later on, I can literally rip the audio from the file because it's a video recording. I can literally rip the audio 
and then just hand it to him if he wants it. Now he can just re-listen to it, unless he just re-listens to it on the platform. And he does. Like sometimes he'll like tell me that he pulled up the episode, the epi- older episode, and was like, "I don't remember exactly what I said in here, but it, it was useful." And so he went ahead and he re-listened to the whole the whole thing, the whole thing, just to find what he what he'd said. And then he listened to it again, and he's like, "Okay, that's helping me, you know, come find and realize something." And like that was something that he does. Like he'll listen to something and he'll be like, "Ooh, I like that nugget. I like that nugget. Let's all put it together." Okay, like that, and he does that for a lot of the things he pulls from, and so that's one of the things that helps him. But um, you know, as far as that goes, that is something you could do with this podcast: is you could hear stuff in each one of the podcasts Paul has, and find a message in there somewhere that works for you. Um, for me, that is a thing that I do a lot. I'll listen to podcasts, audiobooks, I do a lot of listening. And it is me absorbing all this information and then compartmentalizing it and then working with it and then figuring out what to do with it to help benefit Paul, wife, people in my life, me, like that, that's it. It's part of the that we talked about in the last episode. I think it was called serving self, is where you're basically helping yourself heal and move forward. Hope yeah. I said that right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did very well. Did very well. And, and you know, on in line with that, um, one of the sayings from Zeno, who's the father of stoicism and all that, is we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen more than we say. Yep. You know, and listening plays a huge part. It really, really does. And, you know, through our talk and all that, um, a one of my poems came to mind. So I, I brought it up and I'm going to, I'm going to read it. Cause I, I'm going to, yes. Yes. Cause I, I, I want, I want people to, you know, kind of take a thought on how sometimes we, we get so set in thinking that we know everything that we want to, do things ourselves that we don't need help when the reality is, is if we would just reach out, um, we, we, we could get thing, through things a little bit easier. Uh, so this one's titled Error and Ego. Make no mistake, judge not my pride. My sex, my God, my skin, akin, my kin. My path is mine and mine alone to decide. The plateau of vision grows by my side. My flex, my rod, my pen, a pen, my sin. Make no mistake, judge not my pride. A Van Gogh I hear, a cleaner, oh, they lied. My hex, my sod, my wind when I spin. My path is mine and mine alone to decide. The third row I fear, the God I confide. Respect how odd, how thin. And again, make no mistake, judge not my pride. I know, I don't, the claim is wide. Inspect, facade, foten the realm of men. My path is mine and mine alone to decide. I sew with a blunt needle I hide. Weaving X, I prod a fin to zen. Make no mistake, judge not my pride. My path is mine and mine alone to decide. That was awesome. Like that was that was really great actually because it talks about the stuff that we're we've been discussing because yes part of mental health is factors or elements that are in that poem recognize the error and ego mm-hmm. you know recognize the things that you may believe may not believe want to believe think that you are the only one that is dealing with these problems we're all dealing with problems and again you have that fear of reaching out because you've been told it's a sign of weakness it's not it's not you know you want to get better reach out reach out whether it's with a friend whether it's a professional um what what whether it's a psychologist psychiatrist um somebody reach out you know and find something to help you with an outlet you know whether it's writing as you can see i i really get into my writing now i love it it is just it's the one thing that i can rely on i can rely on you know 
it, it, it never fails me, you know, because it's me writing. I don't fail. Exactly. I don't fail. Me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? Exactly. No, I, that's what I think. I, I think that I like most about writing in general is the fact that it doesn't, it, it's, it literally can't fail us because of the fact that, and it depends on your perspective on that, I guess. But like, for, if you're someone out there who's like, I just want to chase dragons and I want to be rich. Well, then you're, you're going to fail yourself because you know, your intentions are not entirely right. pure. But like, if you're someone that's like, Oh, I just want to be able to express myself. Well, there you go. Like literally it's, it's free. It's right there. Um, there's many different ways you can do it uh, without costing money or anything. Since you, you know, a lot of people are worried about cost. Um, it literally costed you nothing to write that poem, which is awesome, which right. is amazing. And, and let, let me clarify in all that because you, you just brought up a point and all that. If you're writing because you, you want to make it a career, um, that in itself could fail, yes. I'm talking about when you're writing for yourself. When yeah. you're writing for yourself, it doesn't matter if you get published or not. It doesn't matter if anybody else reads it or not. You're not writing for the world. You're writing for you. And when you're writing for you, you're not going to fail you. Exactly. Because when you're writing for yourself, or at least writing with the idea that you are the audience and you're just entertaining yourself with whimsy or with funness or stuff, and then eventually you're like, oh, that's right. I have to show this to somebody. And you just kind of like walk up to somebody or you, you use your phone to message them and you're sending a bit. <laughs> Um, basically at that point, then I guess you have to think of how someone else might react to it. But before then, you could play with whimsy. You could be like, wait a minute, what if they did this in the story? Or what if I did this in this poem? Or, you know, whatever it is you're doing. Um, it'll work. Um, it's one of the things we talk, we're talking about is not being infant infantilized and not being turned into a victim and not being turned into something that can be played with and messed around. Like in the sense of like being bullied or becoming a punching bag or, you know, a doormat is, is you basically being like, I am giving myself permission. Listen that real closely. I'm giving myself permission to spread my wings, to flex my muscles and to fly and to surge high in the sky and burn bright. And, you know, a lot of people don't give themselves permission to even do that. They don't even give themselves permission to speak normally. And they are so enveloped by their external environment, whether that's the internet or whether that's in person. Um, they're so swallowed by their external, uh, you know, prison of their mind. It's the external part of your mind. It's the part of your mind that's social. It's, it's uh, people on the internet will say this or that, or people in my real life or other people around me will say this or that. And it's X and Y. It's all negative. Like, it's not positive. It's not, you know, empowering. It's not positively reinforcing. It's you're terrified that you're going to say a thing or do a thing that is you, and they are going to be critical of it or they're going to be hateful toward it. And I can speak to that myself. I can speak to, you know, someone that has to break past that prison. And every time I do, you know, write something or every time I do do an audio book or, Anything I produce or anything that I work with Paul to produce, for instance, and anything I'm watching him produce, it is a active action that fights against that negative, naggling, niggling voice in your head that tries to destroy you. It's these, it's working against the monster. It's the monster that's it's you being in your own way. And it's us as a people being like, no, we're not in our own way. In fact, watch. I just move. And now I'm out of my own way. Now let's go ahead and move forward. And so it's it's a way of not being a victim. It's becoming a survivor. And it's part of that serving self. It's part of that, you know, serving yourself in the sense that it's empowering and, and nurturing others as well. Exactly. And that would not be plagued. Exactly. All right. <laughs> Any closing thoughts? Any closing thoughts? <laughs> In conclusion, I hope that, you know, whatever it is that we presented in this podcast and it's hoping that any messages we imparted, especially this last one I just said, um, one about plagues and things like that and being in your own way, which is something that I myself am a big, big, you know, culprit of, uh, is being in my own way. And you talked to me about that months ago. 
Um, basically, I feel like I help. I hope that there are people out there that this episode will be instrumental or at least an element in helping them move forward and helping them, yeah. whether it's seeking a professional, like the very beginning when you showed that number or whether it's something that's in this, cause this, this is actually just hot, uh, footnotes of a recovery guide for somebody out there. And I just kind of made a hybrid version of it using notes and stuff that I've learned from your guys' podcast with the uh, shadow Fox or with, uh, you know, stoicism with all that stuff that's over there. They're basically little, these are little nuggets that I've gathered and I'm like, let's make a hybrid version and just kind of do it in my own way. And so in conclusion, I hope that this helps somebody. I hope that this creates a gateway in your mind, like a pathway that is like, wait a minute, this is bridging me from A to B and I'm stuck at A. I can't even leave A. So hopefully this helps create a bridge to get to A to B no easier to see and helps you move forward in your life. All right. Yes. Yes. I, and I hope it does too. I did receive a text. Somebody pointed oh, yeah? out that they hear my clock and it's fast. It's, it's not in sync with the time. And oh. I, just, I just wanted to point out my clock is about two to three minutes fast for a reason. It's like a warning. It, it allows me to know that it's about time to start the show. It allows me each quarter of where we're at in the show. And it lets me <laughs> to the end of the show. So it's it's ahead of time for a reason. So, <laughs> but I, I didn't recognize it. Um, it actually comes into the audio loud enough for people to hear, but I guess it does. But yes, it's, it's, it's there for me. It's there for me. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, great show. And remember... Um, keep on eye. We are not doctors. We are not psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, we're not therapists. If you do need, um, help do reach out. I will put the number up here at the end. Um, and I'm going to start putting this number up on all of my shows because I, I, I think, uh, mental health is really, really important. Um, again, you have to take care of yourself. Um, you have to, you know, uh, serve self first before you can, uh, um, help others. You know, you have to be in your best to be able to help others. And I, I really want people to take it to heart and all that, that there, there's nothing wrong with reaching out and asking for help if you need it. And if you ever need someone to talk to or whatever and all that, um, you, you can, you, my Twitter's up there, you know, find me on Twitter, you know, um, hit that follow button and uh, DM me. And, yeah. you know, if, if you, need to have a conversation. I'll have a conversation with you, you know, um, just uh, let me know that, Hey, you saw us on the vellum and you want to have a conversation, you know? So thank yeah, you. again, you can, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. You're very welcome. Yeah. You could talk to me as well. Uh, my, uh, my Twitter is, you know, TPA Wolfric and uh, it's fairly easy to find. I think I want one of the few people with my name, so that might be helpful, but uh, you can always find me also through Paul as well. We often tweet each other stuff or we tweet each other stuff anyway. So if you find Paul, you'll likely find me, but uh, or the other way around. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been an awesome episode, Paul. And I'm glad that you know, I'm glad we did this show. I really am. Yeah, I'm glad that you know, we were able to get this you know, taken care of for us and the world because this is a very important topic to talk about. You know, as much as I like to, we like to talk whimsy and fantasy and escapism, this is a pretty important thing to cover. So Appreciate you and and meow. Meow. All right. 